I accepted Jesus into my heart when I was five years old. I've lived for him ever since. Never minimize the lifelong potential of a child's faith and trust in Jesus. Uh, that's why I believe in kids' ministry. Sometimes people who accept Jesus at an early age feel less than when it comes to testimony time because they don't have the kind of story that makes people laugh and cry and cheer and applaud. But it's a powerful, beautiful story when you follow Jesus for your whole life. In fact, that's the greatest story. When I was in seventh grade, I was a misfit, nerd, reject, every generation has a word for it. I was a shy introvert with thick glasses and I read a book a day. That's the perfect recipe for being picked on in middle school. We didn't use the term bullied, but if we had, I was. Thank God we didn't have social media. At least when I got home, I could get away from it. Now there's no escape. Online bullying is cruel and damaging. I pray for our students and for our parents as they walk with their students through difficult and challenging times. Anyway, it was a Wednesday night youth service, Fargo, North Dakota. I don't remember the message, but I remember the prayer time. Pastor Bruce asked us to sit quiet and listen for God's voice. I was sitting on the second row of bleachers at the back of the room. And with my head bowed, I got, sensed God speak to my heart that I was supposed to be a pastor. My prayer that night wasn't elaborate or fancy. I just said yes to the Lord. I didn't know how things were going to work out. I had no clue how I would ever stand in front of crowds of people and speak because I got nervous and sick when I had to give a book report. But I followed through on my yes, trusting that when the Lord calls, he equips. I'm not here because of personality, talent, or natural ability. I'm here because of the grace of God, lots of hard work, and a heart willing to serve and follow. I never considered doing anything else. From that moment in seventh grade, I committed myself to preparing for ministry, being in ministry, and ultimately pastoring this great church. Next weekend, Cindy and I will celebrate 30 years here at First NLR. That's crazy. Uh, I'm grateful to God for his power and to you for your patience. You are incredibly patient. I look back sometimes now at the first messages I preached as pastor, and I pull them up and I read them. Thank you for being wonderfully kind liars. <laughs> You'd come out and say, that was a great message all the time, knowing it made no sense at all. And I, you just stuck with me, hoping that one day I might say something that would possibly add any value and make sense and that you could understand and stay with me. It's still going to happen one of these days. We're going to get there. But thank you. Every once in a while, I still laugh when I think about being a shy introvert talking in front of big crowds. God has a wonderful sense of humor. I want you to know that God's direction for your life may not always make immediate sense to you. But say yes to the Lord. Work hard to prepare. And open your hearts to Him, His Holy Spirit, and His power. And watch and see how God wants to use you. When I tell you that He has a plan and purpose for you, that's bigger than you can imagine. I'm not just saying that because it sounds good. I'm living that. I accepted Jesus at five and said yes to his call in seventh grade. That's a lifetime of following Jesus. You'd think maybe I'd get a skip card for trouble, but life isn't like that. God never promised things would be easy. In fact, Jesus told his followers, in this world, you'll have trouble. And if they persecuted me, They'll persecute you. That's pretty encouraging, huh? I've had trouble. I don't know that I've been persecuted. I've certainly been harassed by people, by Satan, by some of you. I'm not calling names. And I looked down so you wouldn't think I was directing that directly at you. I've experienced times of loss and disappointment and fear and betrayal and rejection. And through it all, in every season of life, God will bring me to a, a passage of Scripture, to a verse that becomes a key anchor point for my faith. I write it. I say it out loud. I pray it back to God. Uh, when that season in my life comes to an end, that 
that scripture, that passage has been buried deep in my heart. And I looked back this week at just some of the scriptures that have been significant to me in the last few years. I want to share a couple of them with you. I put them all in your outline. I'll just read a few. Psalm chapter 4. I, I remember I remember the season of life, my life, and I remember what was going on and how I was struggling to sleep. And I, I wrote this on an index card that sat on my nightstand next to the bed. And every night, I read it before I went to bed. And when I'd wake up in the middle of the night and not go, be able to go back to sleep, I would read and quote this verse, I will lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. I I remember the season, and it was a it was a particularly ugly time, and people just going after me, and it's now been over 20 years ago. I remember where I was. When I when I was reading that day and in just my personal time with the Lord, I was reading in 2 Timothy, and this verse jumped out at me and has become a key verse for me, 2 Timothy 4.18. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. If you're going through an attack right now and you feel like everybody's against you, that's a verse that you need to circle and then you need to write it down and just keep it with you everywhere you go. He'll rescue you. God said to Joshua, when he took over leadership after Moses, God said, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Don't be terrified. Don't be discouraged. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And I think for many people, this is one of the verses that they lean on. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They'll soar on wings like eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not be faint. I want to show you one more. This is in the book of Zephaniah. Some of you don't even think that's in the Bible. It is. You can look in your index. It's there. You just haven't heard a a message on it. Zephaniah 317. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love and rejoice over you with singing. The the troubles in my life planted those truths deep in my heart. And when I read or quote those verses, I reflect back to the time and how meaningful that was to me in that particular season. Over the years, I've heard people talk about their life verse, a special meaningful scripture. It's often a verse God revealed in a difficult time and one they quote when they need a reminder of God's faithfulness. They memorize it. They print it on t-shirts. Sometimes they get a tattoo. Uh, they post it on social media. And for many, it's the verse that's read at their funeral. It encourages and inspires and challenges. We're doing a series this summer I'm really excited about. Uh, Pastor Parker and I are each going to share our life first. And then for four weeks, each of the four weekend services is going to feature someone different from our church family teaching their life verse so 16 different people. It's going to be an amazing, faith-building look at how God speaks to and through his people. One of the things I love to do is read prayers in the Bible. I personalize it, and then I pray it out loud. I pray it for me, then I pray it for you. Sometimes I pray it for specific ones of you. Other times I pray it for you collectively. Because when I pray scripture, I know I'm praying just dead in the center of God's will. So I, I put, to help you pray scripture for yourself and others, I made a list of 25 powerful scripture prayers. You can find that at firstnlr.com slash scripture prayers, or you can scan the QR code in your bulletin and pull that up. Today, as we continue our study of Ephesians, we come to a passage This is an anchor passage for me. This is one of my life verses. I've prayed this hundreds of times. I've prayed this for me. I've prayed this over you. When I speak to preachers, sometimes I'm a little intimidated when it comes time to pray because so many preachers uh, use big, powerful, flowery words and people clap and shout and get excited when they pray and, and then I pray. And, and I, I don't do quite those impressive things. So often, instead of me trying to form words, 
I will read this prayer from Scripture over them. It's filled with meaning. It inspires and encourages me every time I read it. And I hope that's your response today. As, as I share how I pray over you and we learn the Scripture prayer together, I pray that you'll just leave it encouraged and full of the, the love of Jesus. Now, before I read this, I want to remind you of the context when Paul wrote it. Paul wrote the book we call to Ephesians to a group of churches in Asia Minor. We call it Ephesians because the first place it was read was the church in Ephesus. He wrote this from prison. And so he wrote it, and then it was copied by hand and distributed into all the different churches. They would take that letter, and when they met together, they would read out loud Paul's letter. First two chapters, Paul addressed prejudice and division in the church. And I imagine the room was pretty quiet as church members were challenged with what they needed to change in order that God's church and God's family might have unity. Some were probably wishing the letter would hurry up and end. You know that feeling when I talk about something that's an area where you currently aren't doing right, you're the same way. You get nervous and antsy, you cough a lot, and you just hope that you can get out of here. But then in the middle of the letter, after all the correction, the tone shifts, and we come to this incredible prayer. Paul said, for this reason, and to know what reason, you have to go back to the passage we studied two weeks ago. So let's, let's pop back there for just a moment. Ephesians 2, Paul said, you're no longer foreigners and aliens. You're fellow citizens with God's people. You're members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple to the Lord. And in him, you're being built together, all of you, you're being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So for this reason, because you're now citizens of God's kingdom, because he dwells in you, because you, together you're a place where God lives, for this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Now it's important not to overlook that quick sentence because it contains a key word. You gotta remember the context. Paul said his whole family. He's writing to a church that was struggling with prejudice and division. Some were Jews, some were Greeks, some were Jews, some were Gentiles, some were legalistic. There was all this pressure about ethnicity and race and background. And Paul challenged them and said, you're no longer Jew or Gentile, you're all Christians. Regardless of your background, or your ethnicity, your identity comes from your relationship with Jesus because you're in relationship with him and I'm in relationship with him. We're members of one family. That's important to remember. Our identity is first and foremost that of Christians, followers of Jesus. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are a Christian. So instead of defining our identity as American a Republican, or Democrat, or Latino, or white, or black. First and foremost, our goal is to be biblical Christians, not defined by society, or culture, or politics, but by following God's word as we live in relationship with Jesus. So regardless of your race, your color, your background, your socioeconomic status, where you were born, or what language you speak, we are one family. And because we're one family, we love each other. Now, I want you to know I'm not minimizing your background, your heritage, your race, your culture, your traditions. All that goes into making you uniquely you. We're all made richer by what you bring to the family of God. But those things are not the most important. What matters is you've been saved and cleansed and changed by the love of grace in Jesus. And that makes us part of one family. We are part of the family of God. We all have the same heavenly Father. There are many gifts, but the same Spirit. There are many hands, 
worship the same Lord. There are many words, but the same God who empowers them all. There are many gifts, but the same Spirit. There are many hands, but the same Lord. There are many words, but the same God who empowers them all. We won't be divided. We are a That was Paul's message. Because we are the family of God, we cannot allow anything to divide us. We have to stand strong, and we stand strong when we stand together. What's next is one of the most beautiful prayers in Scripture. As this prayer was read aloud, imagine the atmosphere in the room changed. People begin to smile and then weep and celebrate the incredible goodness of God. It has that effect on me. So I want to read this prayer out loud to you the same way it was read in the early churches 
and know that even as I read this prayer over you, this is the same prayer that's been prayed over God's people for 2,000 years. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. I, I pray that would happen so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the, to the fullness, the measure of all the fullness of God, and now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that's at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and forever. Amen. Isn't that a great prayer? I want to show you how you can use this as a pattern to pray for those you love by showing you how I use this to pray for you. So I'm going to share how I pray for you and, and then just do that today. Paul said, I pray out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Remember where Paul is. He's in prison. You'd understand if his prayer was to be miraculously delivered from prison because God had done that before. God could do it again. But Paul was not a selfish prayer even in a horrible, desperate situation, persecution in prison, his prayer was for the other believers, that they would be spiritually protected and strengthened. Even when you're struggling, especially when you're struggling, intentionally focus outwards and pray that others will be spiritually strong, like physical strength. Spiritual growth and strength doesn't happen overnight. Instead, as you practice the daily disciplines of prayer, reading your Bible, worship, spiritual muscles grow. Although your physical body becomes weaker as you get older, which, by the way, feels like a ripoff, it seems like kids should be weak, and you just get stronger and stronger and stronger, and then one day you flex your muscles and go to heaven. Wouldn't that be awesome? <laughs> doesn't so much work that way. Instead, you just get weaker as you get older. Although your physical body gets weaker, your spiritual body can grow stronger and stronger. Now, now that doesn't mean just because you're old, you're strong in faith. If you're old in age and weak in faith, time to get growing. Spiritual growth and power is not reserved for the young or the talented. It's available to all believers through God's power. Here's how I pray for you. I pray that you'll be spiritually strong, that you'll have strength to resist sin and temptation, that you'll have power to fight the enemy and win. I pray that you won't quit on Jesus when culture or society comes against you, but that you'll go strong in your faith and trust. I pray that you'll be strong to stand in the face of hardship and persecution and opposition. And when it comes, because Jesus said it will, we know it will, when it comes, that you won't be weak and running and hiding, but you'll be standing strong in faith of Jesus. I pray for more of God and less of you, that you'll be strong in him. That's why Paul said, and that's what he meant when he said, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. He wasn't talking about jumping over buildings, running fast, or passing tests he didn't study for. He was talking about enduring difficulty in hard times. Pray for your family, your church leaders, and your leaders that they will be strengthened by the Spirit of God. I pray out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Pray that the people you love would have Jesus in their heart that they would accept his forgiveness. There's more than just repeating a salvation prayer. Pray that Jesus will dwell in their hearts, that they will invite him to be Lord over every area of their life, 
This is what I pray for you. I pray that Jesus will dwell in you, that every area of your life will be submitted to his will and his plan. I pray that he'll be Lord over your relationships and Lord over your habits. I pray that he'll be Lord over the way you handle your money. I pray that the Jesus in you will affect the way you talk to people and about people. I pray that Jesus in you will be reflected in your social media. Let me say that again. I pray that Jesus in you will be reflected in your social media. Yeah. You clap and cheer, now go home and change it. I pray there will be so much of Jesus in you that Satan's schemes fail, that Jesus will dwell in your heart through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. The result of submitting to Jesus, giving him free entry in your life, is the love of God. Pray that those you care about will know God's love. As much as I love my wife and sons, God's love is greater. As much as I love my grandchildren, and I love them a lot. I used to think I loved my sons. Now I recognize I just tolerate them. And they are just the drivers of the vehicles that bring my grandchildren, whom I love, to me. One of my friends said, grandchildren are the reward for not killing your kids. And I just believe in that more every day. Evie drew me a picture Friday night. And when she was drawing it for me, she said, Papa, I'm drawing this for you this picture for you, and when I'm not here and you miss me, look at it and think of me. Oh, she is so much better than her father. It's incredible. As much as I love my grandchildren, God's love is bigger and greater and stronger. There's no human love that holds a candle to God's love. One author wrote, the world cannot comprehend the great love Christ gives because it can't understand Christ. Worldly love is based on attraction and only lasts as long as the attraction. Christ's love is based on his nature and lasts forever. Worldly love lasts until it's offended. Christ's love lasts despite every offense. Worldly love loves for what it can get. Christ's love loves for what it gives. What is incomprehensible to the world is to be normal living for the child of God. When someone asked the famous jazz trumpeter Louis Armstrong to explain jazz, his answer was, man, if I've got to explain it, you ain't got it. <laughs> and until you open your heart to God and experience his love, you can't possibly understand it. You can't. If you're here today or you're watching online and you haven't yet opened your heart to Jesus, you can't possibly get what I'm talking about. His love looks beyond what you are to what you can be. He loves you in spite of your faults and your failures. He looks at you with, with all your habits and hangups and addictions, and he still loves you so much that he died for you. It's an incredible kind of love. God's love is not reserved for some special class of Christian. It's for every Christian. God's love does not run out. Just because he loves me doesn't mean he's got a little less for you. He's got an unlimited, endless supply. And we have a responsibility in light of his love. 1 John chapter 4 says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who's been born of, who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. Because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one's ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us 
and his love is made complete in us. I pray that you will know and experience the love of God and that his love for you will result in your love for others. I pray that you'll understand just how much he loves you, that in moments of low self-esteem and low self-worth, in moments where you're trying to figure out if there's a place for you, that you will not measure yourself by the opinions of others, but instead you will find yourself in the matchless, marvelous, amazing, crazy love of God for you. Paul said, I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Pray that those you love will be filled by God. The word used here for full speaks of total dominance. To be filled by God is to be empty of yourself. It's what John the Baptist said when John the Baptist said, he, Jesus, must increase, but I must decrease. That's my prayer, for more of Jesus and less of me. When I pray for you, I pray for more of Jesus and less of you. I pray that you'll be filled with the love and power of God and the presence of God will spill out of you and overflow to people around you. I pray you'll be so filled up with Jesus that people will see him in you. People will hear him in your words. People will see your life and wonder at whatever's difference about her, that's what I want. I pray that the overflow of your life would affect those around you. I pray that it'd be evident at school and at work and at home and in your family that you'll be filled with his love and filled with him. And then the prayer finishes with my favorite part. Now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. My imagination is pretty big. I imagine a lot of things. I've got big dreams for this church. God's dreamers are bigger. I've got big dreams for you. God's dreams are bigger. I want you to do something. I want you to close your eyes for just a moment. And I want you to imagine the craziest, most out there way God could use you. I mean, stadiums, missions, millions, whole schools coming to Jesus. I want you to imagine the craziest thing, not what you can do, but what God can do through you. Okay, you got it? All right, look back at me. That's a little tiny dream to God. He is able to do way beyond anything you can possibly ask or think or imagine. Pray for the people you love that they will dream big dreams and accomplish great things for God. And listen to me. Don't you dare limit someone else's dream. Just because you're old and you never accomplished what God wanted you to do in your life, don't look at students and say, you need to be realistic. <laughs> students, don't be realistic. Dream God's dream. Big dream, big dreams. God's going to use you to change the world. Don't you limit God because God's not limited. And now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power at work within us. See, that's why God's dream is bigger. Because his power is unlimited. His plans are not based on your talent. It's a good thing. It's his power at work in you. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I've been doing and he will do even, what are those next two words? Greater things. A biblical Christian is not a weak, timid, hiding behind their Bible, passive, scaredy cat. You don't have to live in fear. You don't have to give up or give in. Be confident and bold because the power of God works in you and through you. Isn't that a beautiful prayer? Now that you've learned how to pray this prayer for others, would you let me pray this prayer over you today? I want to pray over you, with you, what I pray over you when I'm not with you. Let's pray. For this reason, I kneel before the Father 
I humble myself before you, Lord. I kneel before you, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives his name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit and your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, will have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to understand the immensity of your love, how much you love us, how much you care about us, how you see us as your children who you love completely. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. Lord, fill your people with you. I pray we'd be so full of you that it would just spill out to everyone around us. Let them see Jesus in us, I pray. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. Thank you, Lord, that you are not limited by my imagination. Thank you, Lord, that your dreams are bigger than our dreams. Lord, I pray for our students especially. I pray that they would dream big dreams. I pray they wouldn't allow anyone to limit their dreams because they serve a limitless God. Lord, let them dream big dreams, knowing that you are the one who can do more than we ask or imagine, not because of who we are, but according to your power at work in us. To you be the glory. Lord, we just lift our hands to you and we declare it. To you be the glory. To you be the glory. You deserve the glory, Lord. To you be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and forever. Amen.